The scripture from, for today is 1 Peter 4, verses 17 through 19. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And it is hard for the righteous to be saved. What will become of the ungodly, or if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Amen. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word and the kids can pitter-patter of little feet downstairs. As the kids head off, go ahead and grab your inserts from inside of your bulletins and get those pens and pencils ready uh, today. You guys will notice it's just only one side of a half sheet, and uh, we'll get that at the end. But with that finishing up, didn't quite get to this last week, and you know what, that's okay. Um, I consider that kind of a divine appointment with uh, everything that's been going on this last week uh, that stopped in verse 16 last week. We often talk about praising God for what he's doing in our lives positively. But when trials and tribulations come, do we praise God in the midst of the trials? We've been talking about that for a number of weeks. This has been basically what Peter's talked about since the beginning of 1 Peter, is how do we deal in trials and tribulations? Are we going to be like Job and say, Lord, even though you slay me, I will still praise you. Well, maybe not the, even though you slay me, even though you take my life, maybe we can take a couple of steps back and go, well, God, even though you bring these trials and tribulations, I'm still going to praise you. But instead, many of us, especially in American Christianity, take a couple more steps and go, well, God, I'm only going to praise you if you give me the good things. Like if you answer all my prayers, if you make sure I have a roof over my head, food on my table, clothes on my back. Lord, if you start to mess with any of those, then you know, I'm, my praises aren't going to be as numerous. My, my prayers aren't going to be as many. And yet, it's the entire reason we come to verse 17. Let's read it again. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For it is better if God... Oh, wrong chapter. Chapter 3. I need chapter 4. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? We don't like to hear these words. Judgment begins in the house of of God first. Before blessing, before revival, before a, a big move of the Holy Spirit, there's always judgment in the house of God first. We don't like to hear that. We don't want to hear that, that God is going to send his spirit to discern what's going on in our hearts and in our minds. That he is going to move throughout each of these pews and cause <coughs> trials and tribulations to come to refine us. First Peter chapter or excuse me, first uh, Corinthians chapter three. That upon the foundation which is Christ is built gold, silver and precious stones, wood, hub, stubble and hay. And at the end days that it'll be tested with fire. And the wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up, but the gold, silver, and precious stones remain. But in that fire, they're refined. Those stones become even more brilliant, even more perfect, even more pure. We don't want to hear that there's fire. We don't want to hear that there's refining. It's a painful process. We don't want to hear that judgment begins right here. We always want it to be outside that door. Oh, God, you know, judge the rest of the wicked world. Sorry to say, folks, and we don't really live like it. The world is already condemned. The world is already judged. 
God is awaiting and, and passing that judgment for a future date and time. They already stand condemned and judged. That is why God is more concerned with what goes on in here than what's going on out there. Even this morning, during Sunday school and before Sunday school, we're, we're always talking about how crazy the world is going and, and how off track it is. We shouldn't be concerned. We should be more concerned with what God is doing in here, in our lives, in our midst, with our families. Yes, the world is going to continue to, to go down the toilet in, in a death spiral. And we should be able to step back and go, that's the way it's going to go. Instead, we should be more concerned is, what is God doing with our kids downstairs? What is God doing in, in Sunday school hour just before this? What is God doing right here, right now in the pews in front of us? That's the judgment that's coming. Whether you want to admit it or not, God is doing something in your life that involves refining. And it might hurt, might be painful, might prick, a little blood might be drawn. And thankful as we look at God doing it in the past that he doesn't quite do things the same as he did back then, thankfully. That we get to step back and, as John often says, that we are thankful for grace. It's grace that sustains God's judgment on our world. As my friend Dr. Howard would say, God is fully just and right to smoke the entire world. But his mercy has put off that judgment for a future. You know, we would want it to be sooner. If it were us, if it were Chris, I would just be throwing lightning bolts left and right. Just bam, bam, you're done. Bam, you're gone. Less, you know, you take one out, let everybody else learns the lesson, right? But God has bigger plans than Chris's plans. In fact, if we look at how God has used judgment in the church, this actually might shock some of you. In Ezekiel chapter 9, the whole nation has gone cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Has gone crazy. Sin in the church, sin outside of the church. Idols in the church. Replacing the true worship of God. People in positions in the church that shouldn't be there. So what does God do? Does God judge the rest of the nation first? Or where does he start? He's in the house of God first. In Ezekiel chapter 9, the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sign and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. Let's pause here a moment before we get to the rest of it. God is, even in his judgment, showing mercy in marking certain individuals that are what? Doing what we've been doing all morning. Groaning and praying and, ask, and continually thanking God for what he is doing. That his judgment, even though it begins in the church, might even pass over us. Big question to ask even this morning, this week. What judgment is God bringing? Let's just take America, because this is where we're at. Or Michigan. What type of judgments is God doing in churches in Michigan? You know, we keep getting reports that churches are closing. We often say that it's a bad thing. Have we considered that it could be, in fact, the judgment of God? on that local congregation. We don't want to say that, because, oh, that's judging. Oh, thou shalt not judge. But if you step back and see, that's not me judging. God is already showing himself in his judgment. Or, worse yet, we often, even this morning, Al was talking about false teaching and about errors that have crept into the church. There's not a promise that God is going to keep everybody out of false teaching, out of error. 
In fact, for those that continue in it, sometimes God steps back and says, go for it. It's all yours. Go as far down and deep into apostasy as you want. That's a judgment from God. Even in, maybe even in the seats here, that God would allow you to go to the point of rejecting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Later on, when we get into 2 Peter, we're going to see that there are going to be those that rise up that are wolves from among us, right here, right in these pews, that lead people down those false teachings, as Al was talking during Sunday school, within us. So no wonder judgment comes here, because it starts here. We don't want to hear it. But thankfully, he marks certain individuals so, thankfully, some folks get spared in the process of judgment. But its effects are felt by everybody. Utterly slay the old men, the young men, the maidens, the little children, and the women. But do not touch um, any man on whom the, is the mark. And you shall start from my sanctuary. So they started with the elders who were before the temple. We don't want to hear this. This is that part of that, that really ugly, nasty, uh, condemning God of the Old Testament. You know, the angry God that just, you do one thing wrong and you're just expecting a lightning bolt from heaven. But one of the things that we often forget, like a diamond, God is multifaceted. He has different qualities and characters that he cannot deny. Some of those characters, two of them in particular, we often want to forget. His righteousness, and that he is a just judge. And they are inextricably linked. That if God, at one point in the future, is going to judge the world, then he also has to judge the church. We think that, oh, well, we've passed judgment. Yes, eternally. We have passed from death unto life. That we are going to pass, go, collect $200, go through the good gate and go to heaven. Yes. But that doesn't mean that God is not going to sift through the, the pews for the wheats and the tares. And that this type of judgment could even happen today. We often question, well, why famines? Why plagues? Why pestilence? Why diseases? We often don't want to say that it's God's judgment upon a people or on a nation. We want, well, that's the Old Testament. That's that, that judging God. Uh, the New Testament, God's got to love. Even in the New Testament, he cannot deny his nature. He cannot deny his very qualities. We want to deny those qualities. We want to say they don't exist. They still exist, whether we admit it or not. Your first fill in the blank this morning is judgment begins in the house of God first. Judgment begins in the house of God first. That's why even more so when we pray, we should pr be praying expectantly. When we pray, we should be really worshiping a God who has chosen to mark us like the people in, the, in Ezekiel. That his judgment has passed over us. Not just in the sense of Passover or of taking communion, that he still continues to pass over even though he could rightfully judge all of the churches in America and we could essentially disappear. But how much worse for those who do not believe? I've talked about the judgment not only in the Old Testament but what God is doing today. We think that's bad. What about those who don't believe? The fact that some people get to the point in which God gives them over to their sin. I dare you to take a moment and think of your own families. I can think of two people right off the top of my head that at some point God gives them over to their sin entirely. That they go as far down and deep as they possibly can. And sometimes it takes their life. 
that that is a part of the, the judgment of God. We don't like to say it. It hurts. We know these people. We love these people. We think of aunts and uncles, maybe even children, cousins, extended family members that God gives them over to their sin and then they either vanish or cease to exist. But the same God who is perfectly just and righteous to judge right here in these pews is also able to give those that are outside exactly what they want. You want to shake your fist at God? You want to say he doesn't exist? You want to say that, that Jesus is just a historical figure? Oh, better be careful. God might give you entirely over to that. How much worse is it for those who do not believe? He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We don't like to say this. Oh, every, God just loves everybody. And yet, there are those who are going to be saved and those who are not. God is just and righteous in both cases. The world stands condemned, and we've passed from judgment unto life. Well, that's not fair. Take it up with God. Take it up with the just judge and the creator and the Lord. We use that word so glibly. Kurias, Lord. Had a different meaning in the first century. Where you had dictators all throughout the world. And they did as they pleased. They knew exactly when they said that someone was a Lord that they had the power of life and death in their hands at any moment. Thankfully, our president doesn't have the, the power of life and death at any moment. But first century Christians knew exactly. In fact, Caesar said that if you do not put a pinch of incense at the altar and say that I am Lord, you cannot buy, you cannot do business, you cannot have a home. First century Christians knew exactly what a Lord was. We've really lost that. If we really say that Jesus is Lord, then he really is Lord. In the, take a step back, he's a benevolent dictator. That he has the power of life and death in his hands. And we are to treat him as such. Not as just this, you know, fat, happy Santa in the sky with a beard. But that's what we do. Oh, Jesus, I need this, I need that. Instead, we're asking the Lord, what is it you want? What is it you require? He's told us what he wants and what he requires. We just kind of go, oh, well, you know, uh, I don't really believe that. No, uh, erase, erase. Yeah, no. Is that how a command from a Lord works? A decree from the king? No, you don't just erase, erase the parts you don't like. You're bound to obey it. This judgment that the, world, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. You want to talk about the judgment that's happening today? Lights come in the world. Jesus. And men still continue, even in the, the presence of that light, still continue to go to the darkness rather than the light. Like cockroaches that scurry when you turn on the light. Uh, unfortunately, growing up, for seven or eight years, we lived in this little apartment building. And unfortunately, they had a roach infestation like crazy. And you couldn't get rid of them because you would bomb one apartment and they'd scurry over to the next one. And then the second the, the chemicals went down, they'd scurry right back. And I remember every time they'd come back, they'd come back with a vengeance. And it was always the second I would turn on the light, especially in the kitchen, you would just see this, this scurry. 
That's exactly what John's talking about here. That men like darkness rather than the light. So that when the light is shined, when Jesus is presented, they crawl into their holes. They find the darkness and they go farther into the darkness to avoid the light. We don't want to say that. We don't want to say that, that mankind is, is evil or bad. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't give us that option. In Matthew chapter 25, this is the passage we have a really hard time with. Sheeps and goats. Sheeps and goats. You guys can read this passage later. Matthew, end of Matthew chapter 25. But the quick and the short of it is, is on the last day, everybody, the small and the great, will be presented before God. And they're separated. Sheeps and goats. The sheep know the master's voice. They follow the master and they, they go past judgment. But the goats are lined up and the books are opened and they're judged according to what's in the books. The sad thing is that even in churches, there's a mixture of sheep. I was having the conversation this week with two other pastors in the area. And we were talking about the fact that sheep want to hear the shepherd's voice. The sheep want to pray more. They want to follow God more. That they're drawn by the shepherd's voice. And we were talking about the fact that often in church you can tell the goats because their voices are different. Many times they're the ones that are complaining the most. Whine. That they want things their way. Do, do sheep really tell the shepherd, well, we really don't like this pasture you've put us in. We don't like the fence that you've put up for our protection. We don't like the fact that you carry a cane to protect us and to guide us around. No, we, we, the sheep don't say that. The sheep are just thankful that they have a shepherd and that they have uh, grass to eat and a place to sleep. We don't want to say that there's a mixture of sheep and goats in the church. Oh, no, everybody's a sheep. Everybody go, bah, and, you know, we're good. We don't want to say that anybody's a goat, but unfortunately, in the majority of churches across America, there's a good percentage of goats. People pretending to be sheep, or worse yet, as we're going to get to in Second Peter, wolves pretending that they're sheep. In Revelation chapter 20, there's a similar description. The scary thing that we really don't want to hear. Then I saw the great white throne and him who sat upon it, and from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Big fancy word is Gehenna. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Scary thoughts. To stand before the Lord and your whole life be laid out in front of you. But more importantly, not, it's not so much the books, plural, but it's the singular book we've got to look out for. The Lamb's Book of Life. That your name is in that book. So that you pass, go, you collect $200, you go to heaven, that you don't have to sit there, I mean... There's a track I would hand out. And in the track, it gave this cartoon of a young man. And it says, oh, I'm a, I'm a good person. I, I do good things. And in the track, it says, well, what if we put a computer chip in your brain that recorded every thought and every deed for a week? And we got everybody together, kind of like we are this morning. And we take Chris's computer chip out. 
and put it on display on the big screen for everybody to see. I don't want anybody to see that. Because even though I'm maturing and looking more and more like Christ, there's still parts of my life that are messed up. Nobody would want to see that, especially a, a goat that's on the outside. Oh, don't, I, even they don't want everybody to see. Just imagine that day when the books are open and every little thought and intention, sins of omission, things that you were supposed to do but didn't do it, and sins of commission, the things that you actually did. That alone is scary enough. As it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? It's a rhetorical question. It's food for thought this week. If we are so thankful that we have been saved, that God saved a wretch like me, then he is perfectly just in dealing with the godless man and the sinner. If the righteous will be rewarded on the earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? I believe here in 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse 18 there, I believe that Peter is quoting Proverbs 11. But often, as is the case in the New Testament, the writers got to maybe write it down as they had learned it. Remember, most of uh, scripture learning up to this point was by memory, was by oral tradition, that you memorize the Torah before your bar mitzvah or bar mitzvah. And we also have to remember that I believe that Peter is quoting this from what's called the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, which varies differently. We just read Proverbs in its translation from the Hebrew, but here, Peter's quoting it from the Greek. So there's slight differences, and it's okay. It's not scary. It's not saying that there's something's wrong with the Bible. We're just taking into account years and the differences in, just even this morning, we probably have five different translations out there that say the same thing, but slightly differently. Same way here in 1 Peter chapter 4. We talked about this earlier. If any man's works burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as though through fire. For those of you wondering, am I a sheep or a goat this morning? That first Peter 3 passage is important. That you must have a foundation. It's Jesus Christ. And no matter what gets built on it, if that foundation is there, when the fire comes and it's all tested... You'll get there, although your tail might be on fire. Or as we often like to say, you'll get there by the, the skin of your teeth. But you'll get there. For me, I would rather continue to build gold, silver, and precious stones. Not so that I get rewarded. Elsewhere we read that we are given crowns. Five different crowns could be given. But ultimately, as we were talking about in Sunday school, solo de gloria, we place them at his feet because he alone is worthy. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator who is in doing what is right. This is our big encouragement. Here's the big takeaway this morning. Are you entrusting your soul to God? in what he is doing, his process, his timing, his divine appointments? Are you trusting in your big plan, your big purpose, your wants, your desires? Is it him or is it I? Those pronouns are super important. In a world really concerned with pronouns, in a similar way we should be concerned with pronouns. When we look at our lives, what are we saying? Are we saying his will be done? Or are we saying my will be done? I would challenge you when you're reading scriptures to follow the pronouns. 
Because very often it constantly points back to God, not us. Those who suffer, we don't want to suffer. We don't want to go through the trials and tribulations. But the fact is, is that they're going to come. We read Job. We read the first chapter of James. We read the last four chapters of Peter. We read Romans 5.3, in which we've been going through quite often, whether it's in Sunday school or here at church, that God gives us the patience, the perseverance, the faith to continue through those trials so that he alone is glorified. That the trials come and we pass through them. That we're not worried. In fact, Brother Ron was asking me this morning with Christie's tests and everything that's going on. He, he basically, he was asking, how are you doing? And I was telling him, I've been down this road. And all the doctor's appointments and tests, it doesn't faze me. Because God has, Romans 5.3 has been, especially the last three years of my life, God has continually put a trophy in this trophy case in my life and I can continuously look back with Chrissy and go, remember this? Remember this? Remember this? So that I'm not worried about what the next trial or tribulation might come because God's already done all this in my life and he's promised that he will continue. He is faithful when Chris is not. He is faithful when Christy is not. He is found faithful. So who should we entrust our souls to? Our whim that goes here and there and everywhere? Or to a faithful creator? Are you entrusting your soul to God this morning? Not just in the moment. Not just in a... Yes, I said a prayer once and, and I've got my ticket to heaven. But instead, are we daily entrusting our souls to God? No matter the judgment, no matter the trials, no matter what life might bring, are we together going to entrust our souls to God? I would hope so. Let's pray. Lord, now as we've taken a look at a tough passage, a couple of verses with a lot to say. Lord, may we endure during the trials that come, even in our midst, even in your church. Lord, we, may we not be concerned with the outside world. May we be concerned with what you are doing right here at Mount Pleasant. Lord, that we would be sheep that seek after the shepherd. That we might be sheep that are thankful for the grass that they eat and the fence that protects them. Lord, that we would never take these things for granted. But yet at the same time, Lord, never wonder when judgment comes, maybe even in our family, in our community, Lord, instead we should be asking, what are you doing? How are you moving? How are you acting? And how is it that we are a part of it? Lord, now as we consider these things this week, may we step back and truly gain a better perspective. Lord, as we worship you, may we truly do so in spirit and in truth, preparing our our hearts and minds also as we give towards benevolence, towards the great needs in our community and even in our congregation. Lord, that uh, we give back to you a portion of that which you've blessed us with in order to bless others. We give you now.